Hey, thanks very much, Grant. I, uh, I've, I I should start with a warning. This is actually the first I've given a, a, actually a number of technical talks about Rust over the last couple of years, um, mostly remote. And uh, this is my first attempt at like a very pro Rust. Actually, it's something that is a very smart thing to invest your time in. And so it is more markety than technical. Uh, and that said, if we do have time, either after the official talk or, or what have you, more than happy to actually pull up some Rust code. Um, I did have a pretty bad experience with the demo gods last WASAT. I don't know if anyone recalls, but that was, um, so I've decided to go with an actual slide deck. So um, Rust is becoming seen to be something that is really important for the software industry generally because we continue to have problems with security, with uh, instability, and uh, and needing to run things like quote unquote cloud native. That is, we would really like our applications to be light and fast. So I would like to demonstrate that Rust is worth learning. And, but I need to remember that actually you're not going to be able to take away a, uh, a new programming language and you, there are a few things that you can apply to basically any domain. So um, yeah, just to start though, <laughs> uh, one caveat, uh, sadly, and I apologize for the small type, uh, I'm not actually a neutral player in this game. Uh, I am a published author on the language. Um, this is my book, and uh, hey, hey, bonus! You get like there's a, there's a code. Um, so if you want forty percent off, um, it's SL McNamara. Uh, that will. And the other thing is, I've actually got the publisher has given me a couple of free codes, and I was going to rope in uh, Grant. If you would like, if it, you're quite good at ballots and kind of random num. <laughs> And I thought you would be a good neutral person if you would like, if anyone would like a free book to email Grant and that way I'm not kind of a new, uh, and, and you can kind of run a ballot at some stage. And, yo. Is there, is there an ETA on hard copies? ETA on hard copies, right. <laughs> so this book um, has been actually a really challenging um, project for me personally. I've probably invested, I did uh, like two and a half thousand hours. Um, on it over the last four years, um, so 10 to 15 hours a week um, for four and a half, close to five years. Um, unlike other technical books that have maybe one or two big examples, this one actually has a big chunky example that is worked through in every chapter that includes, so we want to learn about NTP, so we implement an NTP client. We want to learn about what a CPU is and like what a programming language is, so I implement a virtual like a CPU emulator inside like half of it. Half. So it's it, it's like a total nerd fest. <laughs> uh, May. Yeah, like uh, this May, like as in like, like six weeks away, it's gonna come and it's gonna turn up. <laughs> so uh, actually when you're an author and working with a publisher, you kind of get like pops, like pop things email through it. It's like, oh, so like, First of us all, yeah. So I'm getting emails and like things are getting proofed and stuff, and it's there's no more writing for me to do. It's it's all um, it's all it's all happening. So that's um, that's the promo bit. So um, what I really want to get through to you is that Rust is very very good at being able to make your applications fast and give you the confidence, or at least give me the confidence, kind of a mediocre developer, that uh, it will be reliable. So where do we start? Uh, let's start with, with some quotes. So um, just kind of like people are getting continually excited. Uh, a bit of a quote. Uh, we, we can see that Rust is continuing to be adopted um, through many, many projects. It's recently been pulled into the core of Android as an accepted language for alongside C++. Dropbox has re-implemented their entire storage system, Facebook runs the, they rewrote PHP and H the <laughs> and that interpreter is written in Rust. There's like a thousand Facebook developers currently learning the language. Um, there's a lot of Azure written in Rust. Uh, Linux will probably be there given the, um, 
I don't know if anyone follows this thing online, but um, Linus has just said that, you know, he's willing to give it a go. Uh, and, and, and like closer to New Zealand, it turns out that Rust is actually already on every fire appliance. Um, a narrative AI is a little uh, startup in Auckland relating to photography, and Rocket Lab has um, some embedded stuff, and um, there are other smaller companies also deploying it. Here's the bad news, though. There are kind of like two contradictory statements. Like the first one is like actually Rust is really difficult to learn, but also Rust is kind of weirdly wonderful. Like so, how can these both be true? Uh, I mean, there must be some kind of reason why it has been voted the most loved programming language for five years in a row. Um, so this is an impression from someone writing in 2021, a couple of weeks ago, um, sort of saying that over the last two and a half years, like I, you know, I kind of just wanted, you know, you kind of learn a uh, programming thing or some technology and you're just waiting for the disappointment. And with Rust, it didn't come. And so like, like, what is this thing? Uh, so here's some code, right? Um, yeah, it's, it kind of like has a heritage in kind of like the C-ish space. So we start with kind of a main function. Uh, it kind of has strings that don't look super scary. I'm creating a variable here um, that is actually a CSV file. Uh, so we're doing some data analysis with Rust. <laughs> instead of data analysis with Python. Oh, sorry, with, with R. So um, you can see that it's actually invalid. So down at the bottom row, we've got some corrupted data. This should be numeric, it's not. Uh, and in fact, there's an extra line which with no data in there as well. So to illustrate what I, one of the reasons why I, I really like it is that you get very a very high level feel very low level performance. So I can create an iterator over each line of this penguin data by calling this lines method. And then if I want like an iterator of a tuple with an index and a line, I call enumerate on the records uh, iterator itself. So this will only, one thing about iterators in Rust is that they're, they're lazy. And so there is, uh, and lazy in programming terms means that it only does the work that it requires. There is very, very little uh, extra sort of memory overhead related to this. What we do is if we're on the first line, we skip. So the first line, if you remember, is just the header. And otherwise, if there is nothing available, so I can trim white space, and if there's nothing left, or if the length of that string is, is, is zero, I just skip the line. So we kind of get to our first kind of part of scary syntax. For So a record is one line of our input data. I split that into multiple fields along a comma. Uh, it turns out, just I'll just kind of note the, the single quotes here. So this is a single character that is guaranteed to be UTF-32 encoded, so it's it's f four bytes long. Uh, if you are dealing with a string in Rust, it is guaranteed to be guaranteed to be UTF-8 encoded uh, by design. The if you have a string type, it will be valid UTF-8, like that's guaranteed by the type system. Uh, so we'll split along. We'll get for and for every field, I've, I define. I've got this anonymous function here. I want to trim, trim away any white space. And then I'm collecting them into a vector. And what this syntax here is saying is I've got a, a vector which is kind of like a container or a list. And I would like Rust to please infer the type of the elements of that list. So this kind of underscore says uh, I could give you a type or you can choose one yourself. I don't, I, you know, dear Rust, figure that out. Uh, I need to. So in, in some sense, like this vector and this type annotation here relates to the collect method. We'll see another syntax in a few lines, an, another thing, uh, a, another way of defining inline syntax in a, in a couple of lines time. So uh, this block here looks like it is a runtime thing. I, I've got this kind of weird exclamation mark syntax and I'm saying like if, we'll just read it out loud, if the configuration is debug, please do this. 
is actually compile time construct. So it's a, it's a, it's a uh, if you've worked in C++, this is conditional compilation. We are saying if I'm running with, um, with in, in debug mode, please print to standard error, you know, this syntax here. And we have uh, modeled after Python and um, Python syntax for with inside the curly braces. Uh, this question mark is the debug representation, which is kind of like a default for any struct or for any data type. There is a, a default way that we can convert it, or it can convert itself to a string. That's uh, designed for, so we, we, we can kind of get an error message, or at least a debugging statement uh, in debug mode for ourselves, but when we're actually compiling it for release, that won't appear. Uh, and you'll say, well, actually, Tim, the if statement appears outside of the config thing. So surely there's some kind of runtime check. And then I'll say, aha, the compiler's really, really smart and will optimize away the fact that uh, under release mode, like this will actually kind of compile down to nothing. Rust the Rust compiler is ridiculously good at optimization. And one of the, th and you'll find that there are some constructs, like uh, if you look into it, there's this kind of notion of an option type, which represents missing values or like potentially things that, so I could say like, what is the, uh, like on a list I might have like a pop method. And and that might, if the list is empty, there's it, I might get, there might be no value to kind of pop off the top of the list. It turns out that that actually is represented as a zero size type. There is actually no representation of the none variant inside the, the executable itself. Right, so carrying on. So by the time we get down here, we have a vector or a, a list of things as fields. So we want to pull out the first, the zeroth, <laughs> with, with like real <laughs> index notation. Uh, uh, so we pull out the name of our species, of our penguin, and then the kind of this, this crazy syntax I kind of threw in here just to kind of like fool myself. So what on earth is going on at the bottom? If you can't read this, this is field square brackets one uh, dot the parse method, and then I've got this kind of crazy double colon angle brackets and then F32. So what this is doing is like, I've, I know, Fields one is a string, and please parse that as a floating point number. And if it is successful, assign it to a variable which can only be used inside this block. So this length variable here is only available if two conditions, or if, if this thing here is a valid data point. Uh, so we kind of get in and, and like to me, I, I no longer have kind of beginner eyes, so I don't know if this is ugly or not. To me, it feels quite elegant and concise, but I'm sure to new people, it's like horrible and disgusting. So um, I won't make pronouncements about it being beautiful or elegant, but um, this is like a very, very succinct way of saying, please pass it as, 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 a, as a real number. And uh, and what what's super cool is that I can even though this is kind of a local variable, it's like inside the scope inside the scope of main. I can't. It would be a Rust will refuse to compile if I were to try and use length down here. What I kind of w this isn't the best Rust code. Uh, it I'm trying to pull in as many uh, like Rustisms as possible. What I'm hoping to show you is that you can get a high level syntax with very, very low level performance. So uh, Rust, that we're still talking about, like, what is Rust? Uh, one of the things that the language creator was very, very emphatic about was that there will be no new ideas inside the Rust language itself. The I would only bring things into my new programming language that were already proven as successful within research languages. And so, to me, what makes Rust very unique is the fact that it has no, it, it is just a, like a collection of good ideas. It has been able to build on 30 or 50 years of programming language experience for building difficult software 
and combine that into a system that works very, very well. Uh, and so like its own novelty is actually how that they're combined. Uh, but it's essentially a production system rather than a, than a, than a research system. So now we're going to all play a game. And this is like, this is spot the bug. I'm really sorry for any Ruby programmers out there. <laughs> <laughs> so like, hands up if you've identified the bug. So uh, immediate, is it, was it, what, what, Christian? Single equals, right? So if you're not a programmer, and I apologize for throwing, you know, not starting with this one, but uh, this is a single assignment statement. This is not a comparison. So what happens is that this expression here evaluates to, to something kind of feels truthy to Ruby. So we like we, we, we call this expression with like, huh? And we get true. It kind of def completely defeats the purpose of having a validation method. Uh, I should note that to be in fairness to Ruby, current versions of the interpreter actually warn you against this. If it detects that you're using assignment inside a uh, like an if statement or like a comparison position, it will actually give you a warning. But it will still it's still perfectly happy to run it. It's still valid Ruby code. A Rust will take a much stronger stance and refuse to compile your code. R will fail as well. Python these days will throw a syntax error. So again, I apologize to Ruby for kind of singling it out. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so again, I like I don't. So now is my time. Uh, like I am sort of an ex-Go programmer. I don't want to hate on Go. So, but why not? You know, uh, it's everyone's favorite language. So why not find something wrong about it? I. What? Where's the bug here? You're not going to answer that one. No semicolons, right, there's a big problem. Okay, so the question, so if you're not familiar with Go, it has this ability to kind of call functions in quote unquote, like in a separate context. So what this Go thing does is call work outside the main flow of, ma so uh, if a more traditional way of thinking of this is that it's, in a, it's spawning a separate thread. It turns out in Go is very, very good at doing this kind of concurrent workload and it isn't actually running in a separate thread. It might be, it might not be. We don't know. Well, there is a, it's non-deterministic when work will get done. We don't know if answer, so what the, the problem is that we've got data up here and here. These are, this actually refers to exactly the same position, like object in memory. It's non-deterministic whether or not the value is going to be 24 or 42. There is, and this is perfectly legal Go code. It will compile without warning and run, and it will most of the time probably be this, but we do not know, and it's impossible to guarantee. It compiles and runs. It normally prints out 24. There is literally, it's impossible to know when, when it will be scheduled. Yes, and so so actually this is a very good point. So Christian has made this like, if you run it in a rest checker, like if you use the tooling, the tooling will warn you. Yeah, that, right, and, uh, and this is the thing about tooling. Like Rust has nothing new. Memory safety is still an issue. Like is, there are static analysis tools. There are companies that invest hundreds of millions of engineer hours trying to figure out these bugs, and they write tools that check your code, that it all executes exactly as you intend. The problem is that you either trigger false, like you don't always run them. They, they incur, uh, like the problem with tooling is like it sucks. <laughs> like it, it always is just like one extra step. And it doesn't matter how you, and, uh, you know, you generate false positives or it's like, oh, you, you know, you just get frustrated because of the angry warning message. Uh, so anyway, the lesson for other one is like really be really careful if you are passing data around between contexts. 
you never want a situation where multiple contexts can have right access to data. By all means, share read access around. Do not share right access. So this is kind of like, uh, this is a fun one, I suppose, if you're into C. Um, we've, we've allocated a, a buffer um, for our string, and we've given it a length of 10. And then we say, well, 11th, 12th, and 13th positions, uh, we can assign that to. This will compile into GCC 9 with no, no warnings at all. Uh, completely invalid. We're abusing a lot. And uh, it turns out that it, if you try and run it, the, um, your, 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 your operating system will shut your program down really, really quickly because you're accessing memory that's illegal. But um, being able to build software that is like broken by de default means that uh, our systems are crippled by security holes and memory leaks. And uh, yeah. And like it's unnecessary. It's completely unnecessary. A Rust will guarantee, like, will never allow this. It will not, will refuse to compile. And the other thing around uh, bugs is that we also get, it's not just about problems, it's also about facilitating productive work ethic. Like, and, you know, we want a package manager. We don't want to muck around with like linker problems. And like pulling in third party code should be easy and seamless. And that's what Rust kind of provides you. But even so, the bugs that we've like it's designed to avoid are actually really common in big pieces of software. And like at like a very, very fur like a rough uh, kind of view of it, it's likely that about seventy percent of critical bugs that have been like with published CVEs would have been completely eliminated just by using Rust. Uh, but yeah, again, I want to kind of reiterate that it's actually more about, it, it's, it's, it's more than a language that's just about <sighs> enforcing the rules. It's actually about empowerment. And the reason why people say, I'm still waiting for kind of becoming disenchanted, and yet the disenchantment doesn't come, is that we have tools like Cargo. If I want a new project, I just ask Cargo new. And if I want to build it, I just build, run cargo build. And it will also, of course, like download the dependencies and do all that stuff itself. If I want to run the project, I just run cargo run, cargo test will test, and I can uh, carry on. And I have, um, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's like a panacea of software, but there are some good, like there, are people that are smarter than me have like taken a look and have decided like this is our best shot. And for things that are fundamental, like let's say like we wanted to build like a new TensorFlow or um, like, like a piece of so kind of software infrastructure, um, I think they should be written in Rust. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be the organizer of Ross Wellington, and so if uh, anyone wants to, to hang out and, uh, and, and learn about Rust, and, and it's in particular its applications into data science and, and, uh, and, and like smaller pieces as well, I would love to, to, to see you at that meeting. So um, like, thanks everyone, that's my talk. So the question Grant asked is like, is it true that Rust has the best user community? And Rust has deliberately created, and, and like I, there's a context here, which is that, or the, there's a trite answer, which is like, well, there's like a, that aren't, the question doesn't really have an answer. Like, uh, th but there's a context here. Of open source projects have been historically terrible at being welcoming and inviting to uh, people that are non-privileged. 
Rust has created a at least attempted to build a new model. There was a commitment from the very early days of the Rust project that uh, all interactions will be governed by a code of conduct, which is like quite strictly enforced. And all in, and and therefore, I think also. It, it, the the language is incubated outside of any you know it was kind of slightly incubated by Mozilla like that's kind of where its heritage was but it has always been developed kind of outside of like Mozilla org itself and hasn't been attached let's say like maybe like a Java to like a specific vendor and it has been very inclusive at or at least I feel like as someone based in New Zealand uh, it's been really the, the, the Rust community leaders have been very, very focused at building trust. And so uh, I can't say definitively that it's the best community. But what I can say is that my experience is that there is like less overtly, well, there, like people hate it less. Is that, is that like a much weaker statement that I can make? Uh, I mean, I would really like to say that, that it's, it's a perfect place, but people are not perfect. And so uh, I'm sure that there are things that I am, like, have kind of passed me by, but I'm also very optimistic. Look, one thing, I am a Python programmer. Like, Rust taught me what a pointer was because I was always told that if I was to write a C extension, for like a Python module, that it's either I'm going to either crash my system or cause a SIG fault and like uh, cause a security vulnerability, or I'm like not good enough. Rust was the first co like systems community that kind of brought me in and like accepted me and my you know the fact that I had only run used the dynamic language was fine. It was absolutely fine, and so my personal journey has been really positive, and that's why now I'm advocating for the language. More questions, Eric. What can I build with Rust? Right, right. So the uh, Rust has become a magnet for very smart people, in general. And so, if there are things, you know, it depends on and like each of your subfields. So some subfields are very, very strong. That might be kind of embedded or systems stuff. Things that are kind of adjacent to systems languages, or sorry, uh, system software, like, uh, I, I want to say, you know, the equivalent to CRAN in the Rust community is called Crates.io. We have about 80,000 crates, um, of which I think we've got around about 6 billion downloads. Um, so the ecosystem now is in general very, very strong uh, in many domains. And there are some areas which are patchier. Um, some things that are like, surprisingly cool though are like web. You can compile your Rust code to run in the browser like today. And so effectively you can have the uh, all of the type checking and static analysis applied at compile time for your entire project with and, and like deploy it serverless or uh, cloud native or um, like on the back end or on the front end. Yo. What do the language designers regret so far? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the context for this question is like Python 3 was the backwards incompatibility right. change that, that then fixed some of the things like for 20 years they've been bugging the designers. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so the question. Yeah, the right. So the question was just for the um, just for the benefit of the mic. Like, what do the rust like? Are they what like? What are the regrets? Or if like it was like a language hangover? Like, what would that be? Uh, like, like uh, it took us. Uh, I'll answer that in kind of a roundabout way. Like in 2017, 2018, there were all lots of comparisons with Go. You know, they're kind of like spiritual competitors. One was made by Google, the other one was made by Mozilla and so forth. They both um, seem to target the same area, which is like concurrent programming and, and, and so forth. Rust was slow at getting to 
Like it, it just kind of felt like it was a couple of years behind. It turns out though that what they were doing were like decide uh, they were building a browser engine, like building Servo. And like actually a Dropbox was experimenting like re-engineering their entire system, like their entire storage backend uh, to run on bare metal servers and pull away from AWS and so forth. And the pre 1.0 release was like releases, like there were multiple iterations of the language. And by the time 1.0 came out, they got to the point where they were so confident in the language, uh, like where, what the, 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 um, the trade-offs that they had made, that they, they've actually, there's a guarantee that like in some sense, they were, like in, from the semantic versioning point of view, there will never be a Rust 2.0. We will never make a backwards and compatible change. If you have a project that is, uh, compiles on Rust now, it will always compile. Bar safe, like if, if some unsound, if there was a safety or like an unsoundness um, bug, uh, they have, you know, they kind of reserve the right to like basically stomp on you and say, uh, but these libraries, like the standard library, is now very kind of worn, and those there's like one space, there's one kind of slightly obscure method call, and I can't remember something, um, but in terms of in terms of like what's or the um, I think the hardest thing about learning Rust is this distinction between the string type and the ampersand stir, which is like a reference to an array of uh, UTF-8 encoded bytes. So it turns out that, is that a slice? right. So yeah, it's called a yeah a string slice. So uh, it turns out that there's a distinct. Like, it's kind of the thing you want to play around first is run playing with text. But this distinction between, uh, in, in technical terminology, a heap allocated array and a, just it's like a, effectively a pointer to some bytes that probably live on the stack, like hit you in the face with all of this technical jargon and te technical terminology. And like it's really intimidating and scary. And so, I think if there was one thing that the language designers, like I would like to see, somehow like it'd be lovely if there was some abstraction which says, like hide that for like a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not the, f like it's, it's uh, I, 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 yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, so you, uh, you, and yeah, so there are some, some mental hurdles that you need to get, a, get through. One is that Rust will, demand that you think about who has responsible for cleaning up the value. And there's this notion of kind of an owner, and it's a scope that at the end of the owner's scope, all of the data that it owns is deleted from memory, and it's guaranteed to occur. And so any other references to that data must have been deleted before the owner goes away. That's guaranteed through, and I apologize for more jargon, through kind of this lifetime, as well as a type variable, every single value also has a, a lifetime variable as well, which we didn't actually see in the code that, uh, that I presented before. It's added by the language, uh, com by the compiler itself. Uh, it turns out that every single data point, or like every single value, is annotated with when it becomes a valid thing to access and when it is no longer valid to access. And there are bits and pieces like that that are really fiddly. Rust is pedantic and so and is kind of cumbersome and annoying. It's kind of like uh, yeah, slightly, you know, bureaucratic. And I say slightly, it's bureaucratic. And so that is kind of the downside of Rust that effectively you take on the burden of like the mental, you take on the burden of like thinking about things up front. And uh, so, but yeah, so that's uh, hopefully that kind of slightly answered your, I would love to see text handling simplified somehow, but I don't have the magic wands, unfortunately. Right. 
Right. So I believe so. The question was relating to kind of the serverless computing model, uh, and I think this Google Cloud Run Azure has like a uh, and and has a something as well, Azure Functions even, and like this is kind of the the AWS Lambda um, paradigm as well. Now. Um, because Rust actually exposes itself, it presents itself as C. Like it, it, uh, it looks identical, at like from to something that would have been written by hand in like a C or assembly programming uh, language. It uh, can live anywhere that a um, it, there is no runtime, and so it's it, it 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 there is no runtime at all. Like if I was to run a Python or a Perl or JavaScript thing, like if I wanted to run a, if I wanted to, like JavaScript is a good example because that runs on all of the um, serverless platforms. I need to run it in a node process. Like it's actually Node.js that's actually running the code. Uh, what you'll find in Rust, and so a node thing might be like a couple hundred megabytes of RAM. It might run for, uh, let's say, few. 10, 12 milliseconds just to run up the interpreter, and then you can run the uh, then you can run the JavaScript. A an executable in Rust is as light as you can possibly get. It will uh, probably only take a couple of megabytes of RAM, which is just pre-allocated by the operating system's default. Uh, and it would have finished running or finished executing by the time that the interpreter or whatever language um, has like has finished its processing. Can you elaborate on the difference there between Go and Rust? Because I've been told that Go has a runtime, but I've, always, I've never really understood why people say that binary. Right, 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 right. So, so like, well, I don't know who I don't have time, by the way. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the question was... Yeah, yeah, but, but but feel free to. Free, there's no need to stay. This is kind of like I enjoy nerding out, so I'm gonna stay um, answering questions. Uh, the question was like, what is a runtime, and like, what does it mean for Go to have quote unquote a runtime? Uh, in the in the case of, uh, it's easier actually to think about like the JVM and Java, or the CLR and maybe C sharp. We can sort of see that there is like a thing running alongside your application. Go has less of a runtime. So uh, if I call like the make function, that actually uh, it turns out that when you compile a Go binary, Go itself, the language, will have like a little baby thing that understands what make does and will manage that. And uh, like when we called there was a syntax before, like this Go thing. There is a system, and we I mentioned that it was, it might be running in another thread, it probably is, it might not be. The, as a scheduler, yeah. And that system is actually embedded inside the binary that you compile, and so Go is actually, like every single Go executable is kind of duplicating parts of itself. Yeah, the garbage collector, right? So, so in Rust, there is no garbage collector. There, uh, so there is no man manual memory management, like in the classic sense. We don't have to free ever. The uh, we don't have to call malloc or free. Uh, but and neither do you have to in like Go or Java or anything like this. And the, the difference is that in uh, Go or Python or like pick your run Perl or any kind of C sharp, uh, C sharp, or or whatever you want. Um, these managed languages have like a little piece of software running alongside your application that, in some sense, will halt what you're doing. Spend a couple of milliseconds, check like what needs to be deleted, and will free that memory, and then rerun your uh, rerun the rest of your code. This is the runtime. So. It isn't entirely true that Rust programs, in fact, C programs, do not have a runtime. Uh, it turns out that the memory allocation system, you can opt in to a memory allocator. If you really want to kind of dig into the guts, 
uh, what your program is responsible for doing is saying, dear operating system, I require 10 megabytes. Please give me 10 megabytes and I'll just manage it myself. And the process of managing it, and, but typically you'll only ask for say integers or what have you. Uh, the process of like freeing and allocating memory that you've already reserved for from the operating system is up to you. And this is a, uh, this is known as a memory allocator. It turns out this is actually embedded or like bolted onto your program itself. Uh, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the question was like, well, is it in Rust? And it might not be. So uh, for example, the default allocator for FreeBSD is this thing called JE malloc, which is um, actually embedded inside like Firefox as well. And that used to be the standard allocator that was like bolted onto every Rust program. Then people complained that Rust binaries were too large. And so they decided to default back to the system allocator as well to kind of slim things down. But actually you can specify your own memory allocator if you require. And so memory, memory allocators like all software have trade-offs. If you allocate lots and lots of tiny little objects, then uh, you might have a, you, your allocator, you might choose a different allocator than if you only need a few big things. Uh, text is another one where you have, um, of usually if you're using scientific, oh, I, I, I should probably wrap up. <laughs> Feel free um, to, to pull me aside. I, yeah, I will continue to, to labor on um, if I could, but I will not. Thank you.